Hello everyone, welcome back. By now, we have completed our discussion on the volumetric concepts of mix design. So, with this, uh, we can say that we have completed a major task which is uh, involved in the understanding and in completing the mix design process. So, today we are going to start discussing about the steps of mix design and for this we will be discussing about two popular mix design methods uh, which are uh, typically used and these are the Marshall mix design method and superpave mix design method. If you remember this picture uh, I showed you in the beginning of the picture when I started discussing about the mix design concepts and uh, this is the overall steps which are involved in the mix design process and the steps will remain the same uh, with some differences irrespective of any mix design method we use. And as I said the major uh, task here is to understand the volumetric concept which is finally used to complete the mix design process. I will start discussing the steps again, uh, few of the concepts may be re repetitive, but I have just put it in this presentation uh, just to have a brief uh, recap of what we have already covered. So, uh, coming to the uh, first step in mix design process, it involves the material testing and conformation. So, we have two different materials uh, using which a bituminous mixture is prepared and these are the, bitum the bitumen or the binder and the aggregates. So, uh, once we get the binder which has to be used in the mix design process, we will subject the binder to a series of testing. Now, here I have indicated an example of Indian specification where we follow uh, usually IS 73 when we are talking about unmodified bitumen or the conventional viscosity graded bitumen or IS 15462 which is used for polymer modified binders. If it is a super pave mix design method, then we are going to do the rheological test and the PG grading which we have already completed previously. So, once we get the binder, we will subject it to a series of testing, this testing given by different highway agencies. So, we can just for now, we can just assume that these are a series of tests uh, which are used by any highway agency to confirm the use of binder uh, for construction of the pavement. So, uh, once we have, once we complete the test, we will see if the binder meets the specified ranges or the minimum or the maximum value uh, specified uh, by the uh, codal provision given by the respective highway agency. So, if the uh, binder does not satisfy different criterias, if they are satisfying only few criterias and few are not satisfied, then we are going to change the binder. If it satisfies all the criteria, then of course, we are going to proceed which means we have completed the first task of selecting the bitumen. Now, talking about the importance of bitumen with respect to the performance of the bituminous mixture, if you see the uh, share of bitumen uh, in uh, uh, corresponding to the distress which is rutting or permanent deformation, uh, its role is moderate because rutting is a uh, phenomena which is more dependent on the shear strength of the aggregate skeleton. Uh, however, the stiffness of the bitumen also plays an important role and therefore, the role is moderate. Coming to the fatigue cracking, now fatigue cracking in the bituminous mixture is more or less controlled by the properties of the bitumen. Although there are other factors such as volumetric factors such as air void in the mixture, thickness of the bituminous layer uh, etcetera, but coming to the uh, material category, bitumen plays a very high role in controlling the fatigue behavior. Uh, because uh, it, it is the presence of bitumen that imparts flexibility to the bituminous mixture. Uh, on the other hand, if you talk about low temperature cracking, the role of bitumen is extremely high because if the stiffness of the bitumen is very high at low temperatures, then the chances of cracking or thermal cracking increases. So, therefore, the viscosity or the stiffness or the rheological properties of the bitumen play a very dominant role in controlling occurrence of low temperature cracking in the hot mix asphalt. But it is also interesting to note that when we say that the role of bitumen is so high with respect to different aspects, but if you see the amount of bitumen which we use for the production of bituminous mixture, it is very low. 
it is a if you talk about in, ter in terms of volume, it is approximately 10 to 15 percent of the uh, total volume. Uh, on the other hand, the aggregates occupy more than 80 percent of the volume in the mix. So, um, since in India we are mostly using viscosity graded bitumen and previously we have discussed what are the demerits of uh, viscosity graded bitumen. It does not um, give us uh, a complete idea about the uh, viscoelastic properties of the bitumen uh, for a very wide range of temperature uh, to which bitumen is actually subjected during the service period. So, we still use uh, viscosity grading in India. So, it is important that bitumen being an important material in the bituminous mixture, we move for more advanced form of testing to quantify the properties of bitumen. Moving on to the next step, we have to confirm the aggregates which we are going to use for the production of bituminous mixture. So, uh, with respect to aggregates, there are two tasks which has to be performed. One is to uh, measure the physical properties of the bitumen and to confirm whether the physical properties of the bitumen, it satisfies the criteria given by the highway agency. And the next is to perform the grading of bitumen to select a grade that which sizes will be present in the mix which we are going to produce. And then when this uh, gradation has to come from different stockpiles, how these different stockpiles are uh, to be blended in order to produce the aggregate skeleton. Talking about the physical properties, let us because we will be discussing Marshall and Superpave mix design. So, I have planned to take both the mix design concepts together, so that we can understand the steps as well as differentiate between the two steps in the mix design method. So, if you see the Marshall mix design method, so conventionally we will use the typical uh, test uh, as given by the highway agency. For example, in India we use the specification outlined by Ministry of road transport and highways and it says that we have to perform tests like impact, loss angeles abrasion, soundness, flakiness and elongation index. We have to uh, measure the water absorption and of course, specific gravity is something which we have to uh, measure or calculate irrespective of any mix design process. So, this remains same in both the mix design process. So, in the Marshall mix design which we follow in India, these are the uh, some of the tests uh, which we have to perform to select uh, the aggregate particles or aggregate source. Coming to the super pave mix design method, they have divided the test on aggregates into two parts. The first part uh, is termed as determining the consensus properties. So, consensus properties are properties which the agency feel is more important and should uh, be met by aggregates from different sources irrespective of whichever highway agency is uh, using it. So, these are not very local type of properties which we are determining rather than these are global properties which should be satisfied because these properties are uh, found to be related directly to the performance of the bituminous mixtures. So, uh, these are coarse aggregate angularity which we have already discussed, fine aggregate ang angularity flat and elongated particles. So, you can see that they are giving more importance to the shape attributes uh, of the aggregate particles because it is found by many uh, previous researches that these properties are actually related to the performance of the bituminous mixture. And they also uh, evaluate clay content under the consensus property and they use sand equivalent test to do so. On the other hand, uh, they also perform test which comes under source properties which are more of local material properties by different state agencies which they can ad adopt. And these include tests like toughness, soundness and deleterious materials. And again, the details of this test we have already discussed uh, previously. So, I am not repeating uh, the same here again. Coming to the gradation and blending, uh, we have discussed in detail about how uh, the gradation is selected based on the maximum density line. We have also discussed about how the blending can be done, usually trial and error method is used. We also saw the demonstration of STAB, uh, which is simple tool for aggregate blending, which can be used to select the different possible options of blending the stockpiles to meet the desired gradation. Under the gradation and blending, an important concept which superpave mix design uh, originally included is the uh, use of design aggregate gradation and design aggregate gradation is useful to assess the 
uh, ability of different or multiple ag aggregate gradation which uh, meets the criteria of the lower bound and the upper bound limits, but within this gradation which gradation is more suitable or will uh, specifically meet the VMA criteria can be evaluated using the design aggregate gradation. Design aggregate gradation can also be very useful uh, for optimizing the material uh, combination uh, irrespective of the mix design process. So, the same can be used in Marshall mix design process and in super pave mix design process also. So, uh, but typically uh, when we talk about the Marshall mix design process uh, in India, we rarely perform a step called design aggregate gradation to select appropriate gradation, but as we will discuss today, this can be a very, very important step. Before we start discussing about the design aggregate gradation, uh, this slide is in reference to the previous discussion which we have done. So, this table is given by Asphalt Institute in MS2. So, you can see that what criteria they have put on the consensus properties. Uh, here uh, one important thing about super pay mix design which should be mentioned at this stage is that uh, we have different levels of traffic corresponding to be used in the mix design process. So, you see here they mentioned that the uh, traffic uh, is the 20 year design equivalent standard XL load which will dictate that what should be the limit of the material properties to be used for the production of hot mix asphalt. So, traffic is basically divided into 5 categories. We have traffic less than 0 0.3 MSA, we have traffic 0 0.3 to uh, 3 MSA, we have traffic between 3 to 10 MSA, 10 to 30 MSA and more than 30 MSA. Coming to the consensus properties as we have discussed, we have coarse aggregate angularity, fine aggregate angularity, sand equivalent which is the clay content and uh, flat and elongated particles. Uh, the details of these tests we have already covered previously uh, and here you see that they mention that when the aggregates are used in the bituminous mixture which are within the first 100 mm of the bituminous layer, they have some different criteria in comparison to the aggregates that will be used on the lower side that is beneath 100 mm from the surface. So, the question is why they have considered uh, the material properties corresponding to the depth of the uh, pavement because the I hear the uh, uh, logic is that the materials which are kept on the upper layers, they will be subjected to higher stress levels. So, they should be of superior quality in comparison to the material that are at lower depths. Therefore, uh, they have considered less than equal to 100 mm and more than 100 mm and the criteria are listed here. Here again uh, few more important points, for example, you can see two numbers here. So, if you say that the aggregates which are used let us say at a depth of 50 mm should have a coarse aggregate angularity of 85 slash 80 when the traffic design traffic is in the range of 3 to 10 MSA. So, these two numbers indicate that 85 percent of the coarse aggregate has one or more fractured faces whereas, 80 percent has two or more fractured faces. So, this is the significance of two numbers in the same category. So, I think others are very straightforward that they have put limiting values to different material properties. Coming to the source properties, uh, they have the source properties include the Los Angeles abrasion, sodium or magnesium sulphate soundness and deleterious material which includes two different tests that is the clay lumps of friable particles and lightweight particles and the limits are given in this particular table. So, this is uh, from the super pave mix design process. Okay. Now, we start discussing about the design aggregate gradation and as I mentioned, this is a very uh, important step uh, to be performed to select appropriate gradation from different available options. So, let us try to understand the design aggregate gradation using an example uh, which will make it more clear that what we mean by design aggregate gradation and how these steps are actually performed. So, let us say that we have three stockpiles A, B and C. So, these definitions stockpiles everything we have already covered. So, I hope you will be able to understand it now. So, uh, let us say we have three different stockpile A, B and C which have to be blended to meet some desired criteria. So, we may wish to mix A, B and C in proportions such that the final gradation meets the design gradation limits. In this example, this design limits has been taken uh, 
from Indian specification given by Ministry of Road Transport and Highways and we have selected a bituminous concrete 1 gradation which is typically used uh, in the wearing course. So, uh, let us assume that there are 3 possible ways to combine the stockpiles A, B and C so that they satisfy the gradation criteria. So, this is the gradation criteria the one the line uh, the marker in orange and the red they indicate the upper bound and the lower bound limit for the gradation and you can see some dotted lines within this band uh, including option 1 which is shown using a blue line, uh, option 2 using a green line and uh, option 3 using a uh, approximately brown line which means that these 3 gradations. Now, what are these 3 uh, blending proportions? So, option 1 it includes 30 percent of A, 40 percent of B and 30 percent of C. Um, option 2 it includes 25 percent of A, 45 percent of B and 30 percent of C. On the other hand um, option 3 includes 35 percent of A, 40 percent of B and 25 percent of C and you can see the summation uh, for all is 100 percent and uh, all the options are satisfying the upper bound and the lower bound criteria. So, the question is which option should we select and as we are discussing we will perform a design aggregate gradation so that we make a rational choice of choosing the appropriate aggregate gradation. So, the steps include the first step is that we will make trial blends at one binder content. Now, this is again very important that here you have to realize that we are only making the samples using the 3 gradations at a single binder content. Okay. So, let us say that we choose 4.5 percent as the trial binder content. Now, this trial binder content can be uh, chosen by the engineer based on his local experience, based on the type of mix we are targeting. Uh, this can be very close to the anticipated optimum binder content. So, let us say we are choosing 4.5 percent as the trial binder content. We will make at least 3 samples for repeatability so that we can uh, take the average with more confidence. Then after making the samples we will evaluate the mix design parameters. So, for all the gradations option 1, 2 and 3 we have made uh, bituminous mixtures, cylindrical bituminous mixtures. All right, and they are all made at 4.5 percent binder content and now we are evaluating them and we are assessing the uh, volumetric parameters such as air voids, voids in mineral aggregates and voids filled with bitumen. By now we all know that how these uh, parameters are evaluated for a given mixture. So, I am not discussing about that in detail again. So, this is our trial binder content. So, for the uh, mix the option 1 when we evaluated the mixture uh, we found that these are the values. Similarly, for option 2 we found that these are the values and for option 3 these are the values and you can see they all are different from each other. So, all the options 1, 2 and 3 though they satisfy the uh, gradation criteria their volumetric parameters at 4.5 percent binder content are different. Now, what we are going to do we are going to estimate the binder content corresponding to 4 percent air void. Now, here you have to understand that first we have made uh, mixes at a single binder content and now we are using the results to predict that at what binder content in each of the 3 options we will get 4 percent air voids. And why are we actually doing this step? Because we will see later that our mix design is done corresponding to a target air void content of 4 percent. Okay. So, to estimate this there are 2 assumptions which have been suggested by MS2 and about these suggestions again we have discussed previously using an example which you can recall. So, uh, the first assumption here is that 1 percent reduction in air void increases the binder content by approximately 0 0.4 percent and we have previously discussed this with an example and then we all agreed that it is approximately correct to say that 1 percent reduction in air void increases the binder content by approximately 0 0.4 percent. So, this is the first assumption and the second assumption is 1 percent increase in air void 
increases the VMA by 0.1 to 2 percent. Now, though we have not discussed this uh, particular concept or aspect, uh, I leave it to you to ponder upon it using a pen and paper and try to figure out whether this statement holds true or not. And since now you understand the volumetrics of bituminous mixtures, I am sure you will be able to appreciate or agree upon the statement which is made that 1 percent increase in air void approximately increases the VMA by 0.1 to 2 percent. So, using both these assumption, we can very easily interpolate and calculate the estimated binder content corresponding to 4 percent air void. So, the binder content estimated corresponding to 4 percent air void is given by this simple interpolation formula. Similarly, the VMA estimated corresponding to 4 percent air void and using this assumption can be uh, written using this particular formula. Uh, and as I said that this you can easily derive using the simple interpolation just by drawing a uh, plotting a graph. And then similarly, since we have the uh, estimated binder content and VMA estimated, VFB estimated can be similarly calculated. And you can see that for VFB estimated, uh, we are using 4 percent air void as the final criteria. Now, using the first table which is shown and these assumption and formulas, we can uh, calculate that what will be the binder content corresponding to 4 percent air void. So, if this entire row has to be 4 percent, then what will be this particular row and correspondingly other rows. If you see for example, let us say we are looking at option 2, here at 4 percent we are getting 4.3 percent air voids. So, at 4.5 percent binder content, we are having 4.3 percent air void. So, to get 4 percent air void, if I want this air void to be 4 percent, which means uh, sorry, if I want this uh, air void to be 4 percent, which means 0.3 percent reduction in air voids from what we have now, the binder content should be how much? Using uh, the assumption which we have taken, it should be 4.5 uh, plus 0 0.4 into 0 0.3. I think uh, this is very simple to understand. So, this is 4.62 percent or you can say 4.6 percent. All right. So, if we increase the binder content by 0 0.1 percent, if you see here, uh, the air void reduces by approximately 4.6 percent. All right. So, now again what we have, let us take another example just uh, for VMA also. So, in case of VMA, let us assume that 1 percent increase in air void increases the VMA by approximately 0.2 percent. So, if we see option 3 here, all right, and in option 3, uh, at 4.8 percent air void, at 4.8 percent air void, the VMA is 13.5 percent. So, what should be the VMA at 4 percent air void? Okay? So, uh, it should be how much using the same assumption 13.5 which we have now, we are taking that 0 0.2 percent it will uh, increase into 0 0.8. So, this gives us around 13.3 percent. Okay. So, uh, similarly the VMA can be estimated for other options too. And once we have the estimated binder content and the VMA, the voids filled with bitumen can also be uh, calculated using the simple equation which is shown. So, if you see this table, it presents the final results. Okay. And here if you will see that uh, this row all the values are 4 percent, this three values, we have estimated the uh, binder content to achieve the 4 percent air void and similarly we have calculated other parameters. And these are the limits which is given by the highway agency that for the particular mix for the uh, dense graded mixture, uh, the uh, air void is 4 percent that is fine. The VMA corresponding to the nominal maximum aggregate site should be greater than equal to 12 percent and the VFB should be in the range of 65 to 75 percent. So, in this example interestingly you will see that all the options satisfies the criteria of VMA as well as VFB. Okay. So, this indicates that all the three options are good enough. But what do we do now? So, at this stage we can also look at the uh, economy or the cost of the mix and you will see uh, that option 1 has the least binder content and also satisfies all the criteria. 
and therefore, the cost of this mix will also be lower in comparison to option 2 and 3. Okay. So, a designer can choose option 1 as the design aggregate gradation and then he can proceed to the next step uh, for completing the mix design process. So, as I mentioned the design aggregate gradation is an important part to be incorporated in the mix design. It will help to choose the best possible gradation for optimized performance and in case uh, for example, we are using stab and the stab tells there are, there, there are 100 or 200 possible combination. In that, in that case, it is suggested that the designer can choose uh, 3 to 4 uh, of those option based on his experience or judgment considering that he is he's taking a coarse gradation, a fine gradation, a gradation which is somewhere in the middle of the band and then he can perform the design aggregate gradation on these uh, mixtures and finally, select one for uh, the uh, mix design process. All right, so, we will stop here today and we will continue discussing uh, the steps involved in the Marshall uh, and SuperPay mix design in the next presentation. Thank you.